I'm excited about what you're about to experience this morning. And I want to thank our video team and all of our staff that participated in putting together this great illustrated message. It's dealing with issues I think that every one of us in this room can identify with. All of us have things that have been hidden in our closet for years. Even as born-again believers, we struggle with things in our life. And too many times they're hidden and they're not dealt with. Today we're going to be taking on some issues head on. We want to pray that the Holy Spirit will prepare your heart and your mind to receive what you're about to see and hear as we present to you the illustrated message behind closed doors. It's going to be interesting today. I'm going to be sharing an illustrated message behind closed doors. You know what? A door represents something. The Bible represents something. The Bible even talks about Jesus knocking at a door. And you have the option, right? You have the option. He's not going to force himself in to open it or close it. You know, it's not only what goes on behind closed doors, but the doors itself have the ability to allow something to come in, or it also prevents something from coming in. You have doors in your life. We're going to talk about these doors in your life that have the ability to either barge in, or you can go ahead and resist by closing the doors in your life. You know what? Everything that we deal with is basically an area of opening and closing in our life. We either allow it in our mind, we allow it to affect us, or we're able to reject it, rebuke it, and renounce it. So you have an option today. You have an option with all the things that the devil tries to throw on you. But you know what? You also have the option to open the door to the things of God. Do you remember in the Old Testament when the death angel came, they put blood on the doorpost, on the door? You know what? Maybe today... You're going to realize how you can prevent things from coming into your life, coming into your family, and also where you can allow the Holy Spirit and open a door to that spirit to come in and actually change you and your family. Everything happens behind closed doors because you're behind that door. Are you going to open that door to evil, open the door to God, close the door to evil, close the door to God? You've got a big question today. You'll find out behind closed doors. I open the door to fear. This is my story. Fear set in early for me. I was a daddy's girl whose daddy wasn't really interested in my life or who I was. And I craved his attention. I craved time with him. I craved for him to be at my events. I wanted so badly for my dad to be a part of my life and to build into me, to care for me. I didn't realize how deep that was until I saw my now daughter with my now husband. And suddenly I recognized a deep wounding that I recall all the way back to when I was five years old. On my fifth birthday, my sister committed suicide and that even confirmed more so of my unworthiness in my mind. My father was riddled with a gambling addiction, absent from the home, and my mother was having to navigate lots of brothers with addictions as well. I thought with all the brothers, I would be able to find that void to be filled, but I ended up being resented by them as well. 
Now that the door was open, I had a choice. I could wither away and try to just make it, or I could find power. And that's exactly what I did, but in all the wrong places. You see, my mother was steeped in witchcraft growing up. So in my home, tarot cards, Ouija boards, those were all commonplace. Not only did I play with those things recreationally, but I dabbled in a lot of these dark powers, new age, to try to find some sense of authority in my life that I could walk through and actually get to the other side of my circumstances. But it didn't work. It actually brought anxiety, depression, and eventually panic attacks. So for 37 years, I carried around anxiety, depression, heaviness, until I came to this amazing place, a church of deliverance that taught me that those chains could be broken. I went through a deliverance freedom prayer, multiple freedom prayers, and at the end, I was released, I was delivered, and I was freed from fear. I chose to close the door of fear. My wife, Julie, who you just saw, and I have a daughter that at the age of two or three years old started experiencing fear through night terrors. If you have a child who experiences these things, you know how incredibly scary it can be and how out of control it can seem. If you've never seen this, what it looked like for her was she would raise up in the middle of the night shouting, no, no, just looking into space. And as we would come in in a startle, she looked like her eyes were blacked out. It was almost as if she wasn't there. She didn't know for sure that we were there. And there was nothing we could do except wait it out. And then eventually we'd see it shift as her countenance would change. And she would, in a sense, return to us. We'd soothe her, pray over her. And she'd drift off back to sleep. But they continued year after year. But specifically during the month of October, it became nightly. Every single night. Like clockwork. You could set your watch to it, which was about 3 a.m., that she would shoot up again and start screaming, no, no, no. An authentic terror was coming out of her. We would pray over her. We would anoint her with oil, and then she would fall back to sleep as she came back out of it. But we were at a loss. What, what do we do? What is happening? In our search for answers, we came across a book called Spiritual House Cleaning. And in this book, it, it helps you examine what you have knowingly or unknowingly allowed into your home. For what you and I allow in becomes the new normal. So through this, we discovered something. You see, every Christmas, I set up a giant Christmas village with a train running all in and out of it. But during Halloween, I had a smaller but similar spooky town little ceramic houses that have witches coming in and out of it and cackling and, and uh, winds howling, thunder clapping, scary music, do, do, do. All this while being a children's pastor in the early years of my children's ministry, just thinking it's no big deal. Which parents, I just caution all of us actually, whenever that thinking of it's no big deal comes into our mind that we look a little closer and dig a little deeper. Because those things that we think are no big deal actually probably are. Seemed harmless. Seemed like what I call playing patty cake with the devil. It's fun. It's good. It's all right. Just come on. It's just ceramics. It's just paint. It's just plastic. It's just costume. No big deal. But the Lord revealed to me through this spiritual cleansing that this was an entry point of fear for my daughter. I mean, because they were enamored by it. They would lean in to see all the special effects, but they were also admittedly creeped out by it. I'm responsible for that. I brought it in. That's on me. And the Lord said this, this was it. This was what was bringing that. That coupled with the generational curse, as you already heard my wife talk about, 
with her mother steeped in the occult in Santeria Voodoo in Panama, which led to her, to her sister at 17 to commit suicide, giving in to that fear. And then my wife, decades of demonic nightmares and attacks. The enemy was going after the women in our family. But with my daughter, no, sir. It was going to end here. The Lord said, that has to go. And I'm sure as any of us could attest, when the Lord says something that you enjoy, something you've enjoyed collecting, you've invested in, has to go, it could be a little bit of <laughs> fighting in your spirit. But not on this night. Because when we have allowed something to come in, it may not be affecting me, but if it's hurting those around us, we have to do something about it. So that night, I rebuked it. I renounced it. I said, honey, this has got to go. This is it. This is the entry point. I broke every piece, took back spiritual authority in the home, and I threw it out in the trash. That night, at the age of five years old, her night terrors instantly stopped. It was seemingly harmless. It was no big deal. But she's never had another one since, and she's 13 years old. What do you have in your household that seems like no big deal that needs to be cleaned out? I took spiritual authority back in my home. I said no and closed the door to fear. So good. So awesome. You just heard about two doors, the door of fear. And you know, well, what is this door that we're talking about? We know that a door physically is a place where you come in or you go out, you can open it, you can close it. But we're not talking about a physical door today, are we? We're talking about the access point to our hearts. Somebody say, My heart. heart. See, the heart is the center of all your affections, your desires. It's, It's literally your character, it's what makes you, you. And your heart is the place that has been designed to house the presence of the Lord. You and I are the temple of the Holy Spirit, right? Your heart was created for Jesus. Your heart was created for Him. And when Jesus is in, everything is beautiful. When Jesus is in, there's life, there's joy, there's everything great. But the enemy wants a piece of it. He wants to get in there. He wants to wreak havoc. He wants to mess up your heart. He wants to mess up your home. And today we're going to say no more. Amen. I want to take you into a story in the book of Genesis. Genesis chapter 4. Everybody knows Adam and Eve. Well, Adam and Eve have two sons, Cain and Abel. Cain was a farmer. Abel worked with the flocks. And this is what it says in verse 3. It says, when it was time for the harvest, Cain presented some of his crops as a gift to the Lord. Somebody say, some. Some. Abel also brought a gift, the best portion. Somebody say, the best portion of the firstborn lambs of his flock, and the Lord accepted Abel and his gift. Notice it doesn't just say accepted his gift. He accepted the person. He accepted Abel. I'm going to bring that up in just a moment. But he did not accept Cain and his gift. How do you think that made Cain feel? He got pretty ticked. He got mad. He got angry. He was angry at God. Has anybody ever been angry at God? Maybe he was jealous about his brother getting accepted and him not. Anybody ever been jealous? Come on, be honest, saints. You know what I'm saying? (laughs) Why are you so angry, the Lord asked Cain. Why do you look so dejected? You will be accepted if you do what is right. Somebody say choice. God is giving him a choice here. But if you refuse to do what is right, then watch out for sin is crouching at the door. Where is it at? Yeah, and it's, it, it doesn't just want in, it actually wants to control you. It's not satisfied with just having a foot in the door. It wants the whole thing. It wants to mess up everything because you and I are created in the image of our Savior. We are created in the image of our God. And God has made us for one purpose and the enemy wants to wreak havoc and mess it all up. How many are going to say no more of that? Come on, we're going to pull the curtain back and expose it. Because I guarantee you there's, there's things today that are going to come out that you say, I didn't really realize that. I didn't realize that I had given a foothold. Do you know the Bible says that anger gives a mighty foothold to the enemy? How many have been angry? 
So here you got two offerings that are given. And, he, and I just want to clarify, this is not a matter of God uh, just preferring one offering over the other. It wasn't so much the offering, it was the person. It was the attitude and the motivation and the lack of faith in which Cain offered his gift to God. See, attitude is important. When we come to worship God, it can't be begrudgingly. When we give things to the Lord, when we give our offerings to the Lord, the Bible's really clear that we're to do it with the right kind of attitude as a cheerful giver, right? So attitude is real important. So Cain, you got to see this. Cain was not just bringing an offering with respect. He was bringing whatever was left over, and he said, here you go, God. You like it? And, and, and Abel over here is like, he picks the best of his flock, and he presents the best to the Lord with reverence and respect in faith. Oh, uh, Hebrews 11.4 confirms that, that his offering was given in faith. And so it's interesting statement here in, in Genesis 4.7. It says, you will be accepted if you do what is right, but if you refuse to do what is right. So this decision point is super important. It can go this way or it can go terribly wrong. It can go good or it can go bad. So your decision today is very important. He said, "If watch out because sin is crouching at the door. Now, I got curious about this because it's personifying sin. Sin is crouching at the door, and it wants to control you. Well, that sounds like a person, doesn't it? So many commentators believe that this is not just a, a, an act of disobedience on our part or our mindset or attitude, but it actually is a demonic entity that is waiting for the door to open. It is actually a demonic spirit. It's a demonic enemy on assignment to wreak havoc in your home. You see that? Today's, we're going to say no to that. We're going to recognize it and we're going to say no to it. See, sin's desire is to infiltrate, to dominate, and to ultimately control us. And we're going to say no more today. Let's look at door number two. Watch the video. You just heard a powerful story on closing the door on fear. Fear is an epidemic with people, especially Christians and spirit-filled Christians. It makes no difference. Fear does not care who you are, what you believe, your nationality, ethnicity does not matter at all. Fear is there, but you can conquer that. Close the door to fear. We're going to open another door, and we're going to talk about a door that you need to close called perversion. And perversion is an area that is also an epidemic that I'm finding that so many people, even those that are in the church and love the Lord, are dealing with this spirit. Now, you don't need to be ashamed of this. You just need to realize that there's a spirit in the last days that's going to magnify and increase, and it's going to come into the church. Here's the reason we're discussing it, because we want you to be free. You do not have to live with these areas of conflict and these bondages in your life. You can find perversion on your phone. You can find it on billboards. You can find it in magazines at the supermarket. It's absolutely everywhere. And you know what? There is a battle. We talk about this, but there's a battle for the mind and the battle for the eyes. You have to realize that these eyes and these ears in your mind was not given to you and I for sin, for sexual pleasure, for perversion, it was given to you for the glory of God to be used. These eyes are to be reading your word. My mind is to be the mind of God. I need to take on that spirit. Perversion is something that can be broken. Do not be ashamed of it because it is a spirit that is, is huge because it's a bombardment. The devil has a bombardment on this in the minds of the people across America. So I want you to watch. I want you to listen. And I want you to get free when you see this next story behind closed doors. The door of perversion was open to me. This is my story. At the age of five years old, I was molested and that led until about 20 years old. I was also raped and abused mentally, physically and emotionally. And that led me down a very dangerous path. Those two things um, really opened up the door to perversion to come later on in my life. It led me down a path of searching for validation and a lot of things, including men, alcohol, drugs. Um, I was really feeling hopeless and worthless and unvalued, and I was really lost and angry towards the world. One day I came to a church and 
I encountered some incredible people who showed me love and who were interested in getting to know who I was as an individual. And to me, that stood out. That was so different. And through that, through them, I was able to encounter Jesus in a totally amazing way. And because of that, my life was never the same. Because of the love of Jesus, I chose to close the door of perversion. My name is Jordan and this is my story. Um, from the sixth grade to my early 20s, I was addicted to pornography. Um, it was introduced to me by a friend who showed it to me when I was young and at the time I had no clue what I was opening myself up to. I had uh, no clue that not every good feeling is good for you. You see, soon after that I would start watching it by myself every chance I could and that decision followed me for the rest of my life. You see, it started to change me. It started to change the way I, I thought the way I viewed myself, the way I viewed women. I thought it was dirty. I thought no one could ever love me for the things I've done, you know, and, and I was changing. You see, I tried to stop, but by then, it, take, it had taken a hold on my life. It had taken a hold on my mind and my heart. You see, growing up, I lived with my family, and uh, I lived with my dad, and he was, he was abusive at times, very emotionally and, and mentally, and growing up, I just felt unloved, felt hated, just felt so... Like, I can never be good, and I turned to pornography to fill that void in my life. But little did I know, the thing I was trying to fill myself with was actually taking away. I was trying to, to, to satisfy myself, but always left unsatisfied, felt emptier and emptier. And soon enough, I found myself here at church, and uh, I'd be here down at this altar, and I'd be answering altar calls. I'd be praising God, worshiping, reading my Bible, but this still had a hold on my heart. I felt unqualified to be here. I felt dirty. But then God began to expose some roots that were there that I didn't see. He began to redefine who I was in the moment and say, hey, you're not some dirty kid. You're a kid who's discouraged. You're a kid who needs acceptance. You're a kid looking for the slightest little bit of intimacy you can find. You're just looking in the wrong places. You see, the world loves to label you. <laughs> the world loves to sit there and spotlight you and make you feel like you're so much worse than you are until you can never change. You can never be different. You can never do better. So you cannot do anything with your life. But let me tell you this thing. We have a God who was good. We have a God who died for us. A God who was there in the beginning and the end. A God who was closer than a brother. A God who will never leave you or forsake you. Let me tell you something right now. We have a God who in your darkest moment was there with you right along. Who in the sea, whoever you are, is there with you right now. Waiting for you. You see, I wanted to change for so long. For so long I wanted to change, for so long I was so tired. I would beg God, please help me. Take these thoughts away, take these urges away. But he was waiting on me to make that change. You see, he, he said, no, 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 no. I know you want me to do it, but I want you to do it. You see, and it wasn't until I was up here on a Wednesday night and I was looking at all of our students who were up here, students in this city, some of them your kids, up here just crying, feeling so hopeless feeling so unworthy for the mistakes they've made in their lives, feeling that they can never change and it hit me. Since they can't change because they've never seen change. If they want to change, they need to see change within me. I can't expect change if I can't change. So look, we all have the choice to close the door on perversion, all of us. No matter what you're from or what you've done, what you're doing, we all have the choice. For me, it was never about me. It was about the generations God has called me to change. It was about the young adults in this city I'm called to save. You say, they say our kids will have to face the demons that we never deal with. I close the door on perversions so my kids will never have to. He can preach. You know, last week we asked Jordan to share his testimony. He's like, oh, yeah, cool. I'll share that testimony on homelessness. I said, I don't want you to share the homeless story. You need to share the porn story. He's like, oh, I got to put it all out there. He said, he said, this is his first time. This is the first weekend that he shared this testimony publicly. And I, and, and I just, I use that. I'm, yeah. And I use that because I can relate with his story. 
because I'm a preacher's kid that was bound in pornography. The devil couldn't get me on a lot of things. He couldn't get me drinking, smoking, partying, doing anything like that. But he could get me in a secret sin. I just want to use this for a moment to say, whatever you keep hidden, you cannot be healed from. Whatever you keep in secret. See, there's closets in your heart. And you may look good in all the main rooms of your heart. You're good, you're coming down, you're lifting up your hands, you know how to look the part, you know how to play the part, but there's a moment where that person that has hurt you, you keep a little closet and you go in there and you nurse your wounds. Maybe there's another closet that you got over here and once it gets past that point, you put the kids to bed and all that. You're stressed, you're whatever, you're overwhelmed, you feel like whatever. The enemy's waiting for an open door. He's waiting, waiting for an opportune moment. Do you even know, and I'll add this in because I just come into me right now, but even the temptation of Jesus, the devil comes to Jesus, tempts him with three temptations, Jesus whoops him, right? You know, the Bible says that he waited for an opportune moment. Even after his, his tail whooping, he waited for an opportune moment to, to tempt the Son of God again. How many know if he's going to tempt Jesus, he's also going to tempt us in every way? So we talked about what the door is. It's the access point to our heart. But now let's get a little bit real. How do you open the door, right? Because we're hearing from Julie here, family issues, daddy issues, rejection, occult, hurt, um, Tiffany, abuse, rape, trauma, a Jordan, rejection, discouragement, Pastor Preston with his daughter with something seemingly innocent. So how does this door get open? One way the door gets open is through willful disobedience. See, Cain, back to our story, Cain had a choice, didn't he? And he willfully disobeyed, and because of that, it had led him down a bad path. Maybe you feel justified. Maybe Cain did. He's like, man, my brother, he's always the favorite of my parents and all of this. And maybe he felt justified. Maybe you've been hurt by somebody, so you feel justified in the unforgiveness and the resentment that you have. But I want to tell you, nothing is worth losing that place of Jesus in your heart. Nothing is worth losing your salvation. Nothing is worth holding on to it. Maybe you um, feel like, you know what, I just deserve to have fun. I want to tell you what, sin is only fun for a season. It's fleeting, the Bible says, momentary pleasure. Or it won't hurt anybody else. How many believe that lie? What I, what I do doesn't affect anybody else. It just affects me. That's a bunch of baloney. That's right. That's right. Yeah, it affects those around us. Listen, if the enemy came to us and then there was a knock on the door and then there was this obviously very wicked and evil person standing at the door, look snarling, looking gross, looking terrible, got weapons, all this kind of stuff. And I got my wife and kids inside. How many think that I'm gonna let that person in my house? Absolutely not. That's not going to happen. But he doesn't come like that. The Bible says this in 2 Corinthians. It says even Satan disguises himself as an angel of light. He's going to come in a way that feels good, looks good, all right? And, and, and you want to invite him in. But I'm going to tell you this. Sin promises what it cannot deliver. It promises freedom, but it always leaves you in chains. So listen, don't let 10 seconds of pleasure ruin the next 10 years of your life. Number two, this is the second way that we can open the door, is through careless neglect. This is just being apathetic. This is just going through life. This is not being vigilant. The Bible says this, 1 Peter 5, 8, stay alert. Somebody say, stay alert. You got to watch out. If there's something creeping outside your house in the bushes that you know wants to get in your house, if there's some kind of animal or something that's going to get in and mess up your home, you're going to watch out. You're going to stay alert. It also says this, that we need to be careful with our hearts. Proverbs 4.23, guard your heart above all else. One version says, with all diligence, guard your heart, for it determines the course of your life. The enemy's crouching at the door. Are we going to let him in or no? No. Are we going to let him in? No. No, because his desire is to control you. His desire is to pull you away from the things of God. And the third way that doors get open, and this doesn't even seem right or fair, but it's, but it's a reality, is through the sins of others. So we've got to be careful. You are the doorkeeper for your family. You are the doorkeeper for your homes. Moms and dads, you're the doorkeeper. Single mom, you're the doorkeeper. Hope you're listening down in San Diego. Hope you're listening. Guys, listen, wherever you are. The enemy wants in. But parents, you got to guard. Pastor Preston talked to you about that. 
if there's something that I've allowed in the house, and even my wife and I, we, we've recognized that there's certain things that we've done or watched that we thought were okay, but we were real careful. And then God convicted us and said, God, we're so sorry. We've even brought our kids and said, you know what, guys, we're sorry. We let you watch that. That was scary. You, they couldn't sleep or they had whatever. We are the doorkeepers for our hearts, and it's our job. Nobody else can do it for you. If nobody else can do it, you got to do this for yourself. Listen, you got to be careful who you even let in your house. The kinds of people in your house, the kinds of attitudes that are in your house, the conversations that you're having when they're sitting in the back and you don't think that they're listening. Because if you're resentful and you're hurtful, and if there's giants that you're unwilling to, to lay down and kill, then your children are going to have to deal with those giants. So I got one more door for you. You ready for the last one? All right, let's watch the last video. So now you heard you can close the door on perversion. You can be free. You do not have to live bound for the rest of your life. Now here's another door we want to talk about. This door is going to include all of us because this is where we disconnect from people, from life, from everything. Because we've just been through too much. We've gone through so much pain, uh, so much hurt, so much abuse, I've been maligned so much. I've been talked about so much. I've been through so much. I've been to hell and back. Well, you know what? I don't want to have anything to do with anybody. I don't want to have, you know what it does? It absolutely destroys your dream. It destroys the destiny, the calling of God in your life. Isn't it amazing how the devil can come in and lie to us and tell us that we're not worth anything and you have no value at all? Matter of fact, why don't you just waste away because you can't be used anyway. Look what's happened in your life. So you disconnect. I disconnect from my relationship. I can't do anything about it. I disconnect from my kids. Kids disconnect from their parents. We have all kinds of ways here we can disconnect. I can sit there. You know, it's funny. I was in a restaurant the other day, and Debbie and I were sitting down. We were eating. <laughs> you could see at the other tables, everybody's sitting there, the husband and wife, the kids, everybody else. And then, of course, you have a small kid. we got to put on a video for them to sit. And so we almost teach disconnection. We almost teach people that you know what, you don't need to communicate anymore. You don't need to talk anymore. We have all kinds of ways to do it. We're gonna sit there numb in front of the TV. If Debbie wants to talk to me, she's gotta sit there in front where the TV's in the back so I can watch Sports Center. That's the only way we can have a conversation. That's not true. We disconnect. We need to engage. The Bible is engaged society. It's not disconnect from society. That's what the devil wants to do. Let me separate you instead of bring you together as one. So I want to keep you separate. I want you to disconnect, which is disunity, discord. God says, no, 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 I want you to come together. You're going to hear some stories that's going to change your life. And I want you to pray about closing this door. I opened the door of disconnection. This is my story. I became a caregiver for somebody who was completely addicted to drugs and alcohol. It affected every aspect of our, our life, our family life. Uh, I ended up spending a lot of time protecting the kids and protecting myself. Once that season of my life was over with, I started thinking differently. I started wondering, how come I don't get a life? How, can, how come I don't get to be like normal people? Why should I bear all the responsibility? But in that, I discovered that I was going to uh, the nightclubs. I was uh, drinking a lot more. I found myself disconnecting from my, my children more. I wasn't doing homework with them. I wasn't doing the things that I needed to do. I wasn't showing them the right way to handle certain situations. It, I was just spending my whole time thinking about myself. And that eventually led to drug and alcohol, uh, just preoccupation and eventually addiction. It wasn't until I came to this place that I started doing things differently. I became more connected with my children. I started being more available. I started participating more in what they needed in the life that they had. And your story doesn't have to be so dramatic. It doesn't have to be, uh, it doesn't have to involve drugs and alcohol. Um, what it can do is that that moment that you rather be on social media rather than helping your child with homework, that moment where you put them in front of technology because you want to finish your glass of wine and have your quiet time, those all are signs of disconnection. I know that once God came into my life, um, radical things happened. My children are, 
are now in the church. My son is a, a children's pastor. My daughter works uh, for preschool. Everything has changed. And now what I do is I open the door to connection. I'm so happy I chose to close the door on disconnection. Disconnection was modeled to me as a child. So when trouble came into my life, hurt and disappointment and pain came, it was, seemed normal to disconnect. My parents were miserable together. I never heard them say I love you to one another, let alone say I love you to my siblings and I. When my mom was home, she just numbed out in front of the TV. When my dad came home, she'd leave the house. My dad would sit in front of the TV for hours and numb out. It was like we were completely rejected. I felt completely abandoned by my parents. I felt like I had no worth. Eventually they got a divorce. My mom to this day still numbs out in front of the TV. My dad turned to food as comfort, which led him to dying from obesity at a really young age. All the abandonment and rejection that I was going through led to insecurity. And during my teenage years and my young adult years, insecurity turned to being in multiple relationships, trying to find some sense of belonging, some sense of value and worth. So I would go from one relationship to another, to another, to another, often overlapping each other because I had no worth. I didn't know any better, but I was searching for something. When I met my last husband, I thought, I finally got it. He's given me a sense of value. He took me on great trips, bought me nice things. I felt worth something. I felt loved. I felt like I had family. But of course, when we got married, his hurt and my hurt collided, and it, it was just a disaster. He started drinking heavily and became very mentally abusive. He would tell me the words, you're worth nothing. You're the common denominator to every bad thing that's ever happened in your life. You will never be loved. You will never be good enough. And the day he walked out on our marriage was the day I believed every word. And so everything I had carried through my childhood and everything that happened in that marriage became true. I lost my identity. I literally had no worth and no value. I became completely depressed, which made me withdraw from everything. I stopped investing in my business. I withdrew from my children. I would go to church, but I'd have to leave the, the um, sanctuary because the anxiety I was feeling and the depression I was feeling would lead to a panic attack. I couldn't handle the weight I was carrying from all the pain and the disappointment and how disconnection had robbed me of my identity. I had no value and I couldn't can't carry the weight anymore. I begged God over and over to take me home. Take me home because I can't carry the weight anymore. And, you know, being in a relationship with my kids was hard because they loved me. They loved me. And love is light, right? And light exposes the darkness, and I couldn't bear it. So disconnecting was normal. It's the way I numbed out from the reality of what I was carrying. One day I got invited to this church. I didn't know anything about the house. I lived 40 minutes north. And I came to this place. They did an altar call at the end of the service. And it was like I met God for the first time. He showed me who I really am. He began to deliver me from rejection. He delivered me from abandonment. He broke off the lies of the enemy that told me I had no value, that told me I had no worth. He gave me purpose. I'll never forget the day I looked in the mirror and I saw a different reflection. I saw worth, I saw value, I saw purpose, I saw his beloved, I saw called, I saw hope. The day I began to allow God to come into my life and change everything, generational curses were broken. My kids love the Lord. They're living their best life, following their dreams. They have hope for a better tomorrow. Everything changed. The day I allowed God to come in was the day I closed the door to disconnection. Pretty powerful stories. Do you see yourself in the stories? Last night we had a lady here that was crying down here in the altar. She literally said every single testimony was her story. Every single one of them, every one that we talked about. You may not have that kind of testimony, but there's areas that you know as the Holy Spirit's been moving on you today that he's been talking to you about. So whether you're in San Diego, here in the room, downtown, you're watching online, Listen, I wanna let you in on one little thing here. Here's the great secret that the enemy doesn't want you to think about. 
The secret is that when you open the door to one thing, he never comes alone. When you open the door to one thing, he always comes with friends. You ever seen those scenes in the movies, that, you know, where somebody wants a popular kid to come over to their party, and so they invite them over, but when they show up, they actually have a whole entourage with them. They got the kegs with them, and then the kid at the door is like, whoa, 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 and they start barging in. They start messing up stuff. Lamps get broken. Things are, people are hanging all over. And every kind of wicked thing comes with them. I want to confirm this with Scripture. James 3.16 says this. It says, For wherever there is jealousy and selfish ambition. Hold up. Didn't we say earlier? How many of you ever felt jealous? Be honest. Come on, get your hand up. Get your hand up. You've been jealous. However, however many have, have had selfish ambition? Anybody? Okay, look, 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 look. It says, there you will find disorder and evil of every kind. In other words, the thing the enemy gets you with is just one thing, but it's going to open up the door to a lot of other crazy, all right? A lot of other stuff wants to come in. And so this happened with Cain. Cain opens the door through this disobedience here, through not responding right to God. And, and, And what happens? He becomes the first murderer. How did he get from here to there? You ever found yourself doing something or saying something, you're like, that's not me. I, I, I'm not an angry person. Why am I exploding here? Why am I getting so easily irritated because I opened the door to something? Come on. It's time to pull back the curtain and look. Let's look. Let's look in every closet. Let's look in every corridor. Let's look in every place where we've kept hidden. You know, there's a powerful movie called War Room. How many have seen War Room? Yeah. It's a powerful movie. And there's a, there's a part in there where Priscilla Shire's character You know, her marriage is being wrecked here, and she's in her prayer closet, and she's reading through these scriptures, and she gets to the scripture that says this, submit to God, resist the devil, and he will flee. Can we say that together? Submit to God, resist the devil, say it again, submit to God, okay, everybody this time, say it. You have no power to resist the devil if you're not submitted to God. In other words, you can't can't eradicate the stuff that you need to get out of your heart without the power of the Holy Spirit. But he's got all power. So at this point, she's in there, she's she's saying the scripture. The more she says it, there's this look that comes on her face, this, this like, I don't have to put up with this anymore. I'm tired of the rejection. I'm tired of the hurt. I'm tired of the wounds. I'm tired of nursing my pain. This may be you today. You say, you know what? I'm tired. There's got to be something. Rise up in your spirit to say no more. And so she begins to walk around her house. And let's just look at this last clip. Come on, somebody. Come on. Can you stand up and give God a shout? Can you stand up and give God a shout? But he is the King of kings and the Lord of lords. He defeated death, hell, and the grave. So we don't have to live with the lies any longer. We don't have to live under it any longer. There is victory in the name of Jesus. Hallelujah. We talked about doors today. But there's one door you've got to answer. Where Jesus is knocking at the door. With all love... He is knocking at the door. He said, why are you trying to handle all of this mess on your own? If you'll just open up the door, if you'll just choose to open it up and let me in, I'll kick it out. I'll sweep it out. You just got to give me access. I'm not going to force it on you. You got to give me access. So right now with every head bowed and all eyes closed, I want you to look into your heart. I believe that Jesus right now is knocking on doors to hearts. And the scripture said, submit to God, resist the devil. It's time to submit to God. If you're in this house and you know that there's areas that you are not submitted to the Lordship of Christ, there's things that you've allowed in your life and you are, you've not really made him Lord of your heart. He doesn't have access. Your heart doesn't belong to him. I want you to lift your hand right now all over this house. Lift your hand without delay. Jesus is knocking at your door. All, every section, every section, every section. Right now, come on, lift your hand. Jesus is knocking. You know he's right there. He's saying, if you just let me in. 
Right now, every hand that's lifted, I want you to take a bold step, and I want you to come down to the front. And I want you just to say, you know what, Jesus? I'm going to let you in. It's an act of my will. I choose to let you in. Now, there's going to be pastors and prayer counselors here. But, it, oh, my goodness, every section, people are coming and saying, Jesus, come on in. Jesus, come on in. Jesus, come on in. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. I'm going to tell you right now, this is not to make you scared, but maybe a little bit. With Cain, when he didn't make the right decision, that was the challenge. Right now, you have a decision to make. But if you don't make the right decision today, I'm going to tell you, it's not going to get easier. It's not going to get better. It's not going to be another. This is the opportunity. This is the opportunity. It's been laid out in front of you. Can we get the lights up a little bit, Josh? My goodness. All right, let, are we ready to give our hearts to Jesus? I want you to put your right hand over your heart. And I want you to lift your left hand up to heaven. I want you to say this prayer. Don't just slip it out of your mouth. I want you to say it with all authority. Jesus, Jesus. Come, on come on in. I open the door. Open the door. Come, on come on in. My heart belongs to you now. It's under your lordship. It's under your management. I belong to you. You're my savior. You're my God. Forgive me for all sin. Forgive me for the doors that I've opened in my life and the enemy that I've allowed to be in me. No more in Jesus' name. Now I want you just to lift up your voice and give God thanks and praise for what he's doing. Yeah. Right now, those that are in the altar, are gonna, they're going to give you a card. I want you to fill up, but I'm not done yet. I got one more. Give me two more minutes. Give me two more minutes. This is for everybody else that didn't answer the altar call. This is for everybody that says, you know what? I know that there's a secret closet. I know that there's a hurt. There's a rejection. There's a wound. There's something. Maybe it's decades old. And it's still, you're still dealing with the ramifications. And maybe before this message, you didn't even think about it. You just thought you were just living life, and this is just normal. This is just what I have to go through. But I'm telling you today that unless you're experiencing the abundant life that Jesus came to give you, there most likely is something that you've entertained, that you've allowed. Maybe you've, you've just welcomed to ride in, or maybe because of the hurts of others. And if that's you, I just want you to lift up both hands. I know this message is for everybody. And God is going to heal you now. We're going to take the authority like, like she did in that, that little clip there. We're going to take the authority. So believer now, every person in this house is a believer now because you've accepted Jesus. So now you have the authority and the power. He says, I give you power over all the power of the enemy. Right? How many, you got power over all the power of the enemy. You don't have to tolerate it any longer. So right now, shout this out. Jesus, Jesus. In, your in your authority, I kick out everything that has been allowed in my heart rejection hurt abuse abandonment identity issues perversion disconnection go in the name of Jesus I serve you notice I evict you from my heart in Jesus you are the Lord of my life <laughs> Let's shout to Jesus and give him a thanks and a praise offering.